Well, we picked a series this July, four messages. We've entitled the series, The People's Choice, and we put the choice to you. What do you want to hear for the next four weekends in church? And here are the topics you selected, end times, marriage, purpose, and mental health. So if you don't like this series, it's your fault. You're the one that picked it. Amen. <clears throat> so the first one is on end times, and I'm excited to share a message with you <clears throat> Excuse me, that I've entitled Satan's Fury, The End is Near. Now, we know that a series at end times really is not a 30-minute message. It's a series. So all we're going to do is whet your spiritual appetite, and this will lead into a series on end times down the road. So you know the routine, out of love, respect, out of honor for the reading of the sacred scriptures, God's word, please stand to your feet. I'll be reading from the book of Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come to, to, down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Let us pray. Father, we know that your arch enemy, our arch enemy, the devil, is referred to in this section of Scripture as the serpent, as the dragon, as the devil, as the accuser of the brethren. And thank you that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, loving not our lives even unto the death. So, Father, speak to us through this section of Scripture. May we have ears to hear and heart to receive the engrafted word. We pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be present now in the teaching of your word. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so, what if your life came with an expiration date? Would you live differently? Uh, yesterday, I was at the, the new Market Street uh, marketplace, and I was buying some yogurt. And I was picking out <clears throat> the yogurt I was going to buy, and guess what, is, guess what the first thing is that I looked at? The expiration date. There was one that said July the 11th, and one that said July 31st, the expiration date. Guess which one I left for you? <laughs> I picked the July 31st. And I'm pretty much a stickler, you know. If the expiration dates, if it's past due... I throw it out, right? Some of you tempt the Lord in that way. <laughs> so an expiration date lets you know how much time is left. And really, when you think of our lives, our lives all have an expiration date. We just don't know the exact date. But what would change if you knew that you had six months, six years, or 60 years to live? Would you live any differently? You see, really, we should all embrace the brevity of life. Over the past month, two people I care about have passed on to be with the Lord. One very close that's been a member of our church for the entire time that my wife and I have been here. And so it caused me to pause. It caused me to be thankful, really, for, for two groups of people, for medical professionals who dedicate and spend their lives trying to preserve life, extend life, and save life. God bless you for that. But then when, when death comes, thank God for the bereavement industry. Thank God for those that provide loving care for a family who are grieving in the loss of their loved one and the services that they provide. And it just reminds us that every day is a gift from God. Every day we should be grateful. Every day we should be thankful. We should live our life to the fullest. Because really, in the full scheme of things, whether you live to 20 or 40 or 60, 80 or 100, what is our life but a vapor? It appears for a little while and then it's gone. In comparison to eternity, our time in this world is very short, and it's very brief, and that's why we must make the most of every opportunity because the days indeed are evil. Our time is short. Here in Revelation 12, 
the John the Revelator, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us that Satan has come down to the earth with great wrath. And the reason he's come down to the earth with great wrath is because he knows that his time is short and he is very angry. Hence, Satan's fury. He knows that he has a short time and he's not taking any days off and he's working around the clock to wreak as much havoc in the world as possible. And we can see the wrath of Satan throughout the Holy Scriptures. We see it in the book of Genesis. Before Adam and Eve, before Adam was created and Eve was made from Adam's side, the devil was already there. He had already been cast down to the earth. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, I beheld Satan fall like lightning to the earth. And he's come down and it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. And he knows his time is short. We see the wrath of Satan throughout the Bible, particularly in the story of Job. One man, one man that the devil picked on. Why? Because he seethes with anger and hatred for God and God's people. Really for all people, because all of us are created in the image and likeness of God. And he accused Job falsely to God. He said, Job's only serving you, God, because you've blessed him with marriage and family and success. You have a hedge of protection around him. If you remove that hedge of protection and allow me to attack him, he'll curse you to your face. God said, go ahead, just spare his life. We see the wrath and the seething anger of Satan that he can't directly take it out on God, so he takes it out on God's creation, on the expression of God's love, mankind itself. And as the coming of Christ nears, Satan's rage barometer will go off the charts. Now consider the target of Satan's hatred. Here in Revelation chapter 12, it mentions a woman who gave birth to a male child. Well, you have to understand the book of Revelation really is in chronological order, uh, except for the 12th chapter. It's a parenthetical chapter. The book of Revelation, it begins with the introduction, but in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, John the Revelator says, come up hither. And it is the calling of the bride of Christ to heaven. It is, a, it is speaking of the rapture of the church. When the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning verse 13, Paul said, I don't want you to sorrow as others who have no hope concerning those who have fallen asleep. Because if we believe that Christ died and rose again, we will rise together with him. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those who are being raised from the dead in Christ. And we shall meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That is Paul the Apostle writing to the Thessalonians, describing what is termed and what is known in the Scriptures as the rapture of the church. You see, the second coming of Christ happens in two parts. Just like the first coming of Christ happened in two parts, there was his birth, his death, and resurrection. The second coming of Christ happens in two parts. There's the rapture of the church. It can happen at any time. No other prophecy has to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. When it happens, all of us who are alive, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed, we will be glorified, we will be transformed. Those who are dead in Christ will be raised from the dead. Their spirits and souls will come from heaven back into their bodies. All of us will have glorified bodies, and all of us together will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. You say, you say, that sounds far-fetched. That sounds like some fanciful, you know, Disney production. No, friend, it's more real than the chair you are seated on today, and it's going to happen in the near future, and I can't wait to be a part of that great moment. So the book of Revelation chronological order begins with the rapture of the church because we're not appointed under wrath, and then the seven-year tribulation period begins. Daniel's 70th week, talked about in the book of Daniel, spoken about by the prophets. Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble that lasts seven years. Seven years. The first, seven, first half of the seven years, the Antichrist, this world uh, uh, force of power in the, in the world will deceive most of the nations. And most of the nations will follow him. And then the severity of the tribulation begins the last three and a half years. And the woman talked about here in Romans 12 will be given wings to be spared. That's speaking of the nation of Israel. The primary interpretation of the woman mentioned here in Revelation 12, the primary interpretation in context is Israel, speaking of how she gave birth to Christ the Messiah. But also as a spiritual application of the church, which is the bride of Christ. 
that the devil, the target of, of Satan's hatred, number one, is Israel. And the reason that Satan hates the Jewish people, and he's always hated the Jewish people, is because through the Jewish nation came the prophets, came the sacred holy scriptures, and through the Jewish nation came the male child, the Savior of the world. Satan has persecuted the Jewish people since the beginning of time, since they were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, all the way up until the time of World War II and Hitler and the extermination and the Holocaust of six million plus Jewish people, to Islamists, radical Islamists today, Satan hates the Jewish people. If there is an ounce of hatred in your heart for the Jewish people, I want you to know that's the seed that Satan has planted in your heart, and you must strike it from your life as quickly as possible. The Jewish people are God's chosen people, and God has a plan still yet for the Jewish people. The second target of Satan's hatred is the New Testament remnant church. Satan hates the remnant church of Christ. Satan hates every born-again believer in the world. You are the object of his seething anger and hatred. He can't get to God, so he attacks those that were created in the image and likeness of God and those who represent Christ in the earth today. But not only is Israel the target of Satan's hatred, and not only is the church and every Christian the target of Satan's hatred, listen to me very carefully, America is the target of Satan's hatred. Satan hates the United States of America because America undeniably was based and built and has Christian roots. And it's the fact that we, in the history of the world, there's never been a nation like America that has proclaimed the gospel message around the world like these United States of America. And Satan hates our Christian heritage. Friend, don't fool yourself. It's not because of our, the sins of our past that we are such a hated and despised nation. It's because we are the greatest beacon of hope and freedom and liberty the world has ever seen. And that, my friend, is directly result, related to our Christian heritage. Think of it. What the fascist Axis powers of evil could not do in World War II. What the communist totalitarianism regimes couldn't do in the 60s and 70s. What the radical Islamist terrorists couldn't do in the 2000s, namely destroy America, the liberal, progressive, God-hating, anti-American movement of the past generation, and more recently, over the last 36 months, has been able to all but drive a stake in the heart of Lady Liberty. But I'm here to tell you today that God is in the resurrection business, and God can reawaken <laughs> revival in America. I don't believe he's finished with us yet. Now listen to me very carefully. Our mission as Christians, you've heard me say this over the past year, our mission as Christians is not to save America, but to save Americans. And not just Americans, all souls around the world. But we're called and we live in America. So our mission is not to save America. Our mission is to save Americans. And in the process of saving Americans, we might just be able to save America. God bless America. America is blessed because America has blessed God. And when we stop blessing God, God will stop blessing us. Satan's rage is a gauge of how close we are to the end. Once again, Revelation 12, 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why? Because the accuser that had been in the heavens had now been, has now been cast down. But woe to where he's ended up. Woe, as it says, to the inhabitants of the earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Say those two words with me. Great wrath. Say them again. Great wrath. Why? Because he knows that he has a short time. This verse has fascinated me for really the last 40 years of walking with Christ. I've never heard a sermon on it, and I've never preached from this section of Scripture before. So I looked up the word wrath, great wrath, the wrath of Satan. And that word wrath, the way it was used in ancient Greek, it speaks of extreme anger. He is furious. He is seething with anger. His heart and liver are literally on fire because of the anger he has towards God, towards Israel, towards the church, and towards a country like America that preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And Satan knows his time is short. Since the inception, since the beginning, he knows his time is short. In Matthew 8, 29, the demon spoke out of a man who was being set free of these demons, and the demon said, have you come here to torment us before our time? The devil knows there is an appointed time when he and all of his fallen angels, one-third of the angels, fell with him in the great rebellion in heaven, and there was a great war in heaven spoken about here in Revelation 12. Once again, Revelation 12 is a parenthetical chapter. It speaks of what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen, all in that one chapter. He was cast down. He was defeated by Michael and, his, and, 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 and Michael's angels. And so now he knows that the day is coming when he and his angels will be thrown in the lake of fire, where there will be burning and suffering throughout eternity. Jesus said this out of his own mouth. Jesus said, hell was not created for the devil and his angels. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for man. And yet, Satan is doing everything he can to drag as many souls of men with him and his fallen angels to that lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Thank God you're not going there. We're not going there. Jesus made a way, and the way is the cross of Christ. And if we'll put our faith and trust in him, hallelujah, we're going to go to heaven and not hell. Turn to your neighbor and do a little evangelism and say, thank God you're not going to that place called hell. Come on. Thank God you're not going there. And if they're doubtful, say, I won't let you go there. Hallelujah. Drag them to the cross. Get them saved. Amen. Satan's rage, Satan's wrath, Satan's anger. His fury is directly attached to the countdown clock, which is running out, and so he's lashing out. The distance between now and the end determines his level of rage, and that's why we know we're in the last of the last days. In proportion to his time shrinking, his intensity and intention for evil in the world will only increase. So what can we learn from our enemy, from the devil himself? As he sees his day approaching, how should we live our lives as we see the day of Christ approaching? There are two particular days mentioned in the Bible, the day of the Lord or the day of God. That's, how, that's actually mentioned in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, the day of God, and the day of Christ, which is only mentioned in the New Testament, the day of Christ. Those are two different days. One day is a day of wrath and judgment. Another day is a day of blessing and rejoicing. You and I who know Christ, love Christ, and are serving Christ, we, will, we are not appointed to the day of God's judgment or the day of God, which is really the seven-year period or the last three and a half years of the seven-year period of tribulation described in the book of Revelation. We will be a part of the day of Christ. The day of Christ speaks of the rapture of the church. The day of Christ speaks of us going up to heaven because, you see, the Bible says in the book of Revelation 19, prophesied by Enoch long ago, spoken of by Jude in the book of Jude, the Lord will return with 10,000s of his saints at the second coming, at the battle of Armageddon. The Lord will return with 10,000s of his saints. How can the Lord return with 10,000s of his saints unless he's first come for his saints? So at the rapture of the church, he comes for his saints, and then at the second coming, he comes back with his saints. So we will be a part of that day called the day of Christ, which is the rapture of the church, which I described a moment ago. So that's why, look at Hebrews 10, 25, and let's read this verse out loud together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day, what day? The day of Christ, the day of the rapture. The day of us being called, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will return again, that where I am there you may also be. And we live every day in hope this could be the day or not. We're going to live as though it's, you know, you should live every day as though it's your first day and your last day. You should live every day as though Christ is coming back today and you should live every day or you should plan for the future as, as though he's not coming back for your lifetime. But we live in anticipation for the great and glorious day of the coming of Jesus Christ, and we, would, we should live with a sense of urgency. We should live with this sense of realizing there is an expiration date. There is a, our time is short, and we need to make the most of the time that's been allotted to us. Now imagine this, Satan's rage, Satan's fury, the wrath of Satan. All the slaves of Satan can get nothing for their service. They get nothing except condemnation and damnation. According to Scripture, Satan is number one man's tempter. Number two, man's accuser. And number three, man's tormentor. 
Satan has lost every battle. He lost his battle in heaven. He lost his battle in the garden. He lost his battle at the cross. He lost his battle at the resurrection. He lost his battle on the day of Pentecost. He's lost. You know why he's so angry? Because his pride has been injured. Because he's lost every battle. And the one that counts the most, he's going to lose that. He's a loser. That's why he's so angry. And thank God we're on the winning team, not the losing team. And he knows his time is short. Why is there so much evil in our world? It's right here, Revelation 12, 12. Because the devil has come down to you. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down having great wrath, because he knows his time is short. And herein lies the clearest explanation for the concept of evil in the world. All hatred, all perversion in the world has a source, and its source is Satan. And the Bible says he is a powerful foe. Jesus said he's a king over a kingdom, and his kingdom is not divided. It's united. He's well organized. He's highly skilled. He has strategies. He has a large army of fallen angels and fallen humanity at his beck and call and command. Politicians, money tycoons, entertainment industry, the media, news outlets, false religions, and fake Christians are all a part of this growing army that will confront Christ on that day, the great day of the battle of Armageddon. So he knows his time is short. What time? If you look up the word time in the Greek New Testament here in the book of Revelation, it's not chronos, which means chronological time. Like, what time is it now? 12.06, and my time is short, so i got to hurry up. <laughs> his time is kairos. What time is it that the devil… Kairos is a, not a chronological amount of time. It is a season, a moment, and he, he senses and he knows. He doesn't know the day or the hour. No man knows the day or the hour of Christ's return except the Father. But he knows it's getting close, and he's known it for 2,000 years. And listen, if the coming of Christ was close 2,000 years ago, imagine how close it is today. So what time is it? Kairos. He understands that moment. And you and I need to understand the Kairos moments in our life, and we must take advantage. Once again, as Paul said, right into the, to the Ephesians, make the most of every opportunity. Carpe diem, seize the moment, seize the day. Why? Because the days are evil, and they're only going to get worse. Satan is angry, and I'll tell you what makes him angry, and I think it's our job to make him more angry every day. Every day you should wake up and say, Lord, how can I make the devil more angry? Here are some ways. Satan is angry when in your marriage you love one another. Satan hates marriage because it's a miniature replica, repl replication of the kingdom of God and the marriage of Christ in the church. He hates biblical marriage. He hates your marriage. He's angry when your marriage is filled with love. So let's make the devil more angry than he's ever been. Let's love our spouses and love our families unlike we've ever loved them before. Get all animosity and anger and hatred out. Satan is angry when children are raised in a loving home with their father and their mother. He hates that. Satan is angry when kids are being raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Why? Because he's angry and he hates kids. Satan hates children. Why? Because there's a mark. There's a target on every one of your kids. What's the target? What's the mark? Jesus pulled a kid aside and said, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Children remind the devil of God's kingdom and those who are deserving of God's kingdom, and he knows he will never be a part of God's kingdom again. And so he hates children. He's angry. He's angry when you love your neighbor because he wants you to judge your neighbor. He wants you to hate your neighbor. He thrives on discord and division in homes and churches and in businesses. Paul, the apostle, said, where there's envy and strife, there is every evil work. Wherever there's envy, wherever there's strife, it opens the widest door to allow Satan and all of the demons of darkness to come into that relationship or the lives of those people. He rages against all joyful Christianity, all joyful Christians. There's nothing that makes the devil more angry when your life is defined by the joy of the Lord. Don't let the world, the flesh, or the devil steal your joy, friend. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, and the joy of the Lord is the proof and the authentic evidence of your salvation. Because we have his joy. He rages against all sound biblical teaching. And ladies, he rages against the uniqueness of your God-given femininity. 
Embrace your femininity. Embrace the uniqueness of how God designed, created, and made a woman. And men, Satan rages against the attractiveness of your God-given masculinity. Biblical manhood. Biblical masculinity. God wants you to take it back. God wants you to embrace it. And God wants you to be the man that he's called you to be. Paul said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Let us be the men that God's called us to be. He rages against your success, your health, your happiness. He gloats in people's sickness and disease and poverty. And he rages against our freedom in Christ. He wants you strapped down by legalism, by man-made religions and man-made traditions. But you must know the devil is defeatable. You must know that victory is promised and victory is achievable through Christ Jesus. And in closing, I want to give you the three keys to victory over Satan in these last days. Three keys to victory over Satan in these last days. One, number one, you overcome him, number one, by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. It said they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus has power. Oh, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the shed blood of Christ on Calvary and the power that's in that blood. It's what defeats the accuser of the brethren. The devil says you're no good. How could God love you? Matter of fact, he doesn't love you. How can you call yourself a Christian? You know what you're struggling with. You know what you, where you've been. You know what you've done. You know what you're doing. You're not even worthy to read the Bible. You shouldn't even go to church. Constantly, 24-7, the devil accuses you, but you and I can overcome the accusations of the devil by the shed blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Because no matter where you've been or what you're doing or how you're thinking or what you're struggling with, if you're a Christian, God sees you through his son. He sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you and I stand before him without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, or anything. We can walk before God without any condemnation. And friend, it's not a license to go out and sin anymore. But Paul said, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I've said it before, you'll run out of sin and ways to sin before God will ever run out of grace and mercy that he provides whenever we repent. There's power in the blood. But listen, it's not some superstitious belief in the blood, right? It's not some superstitious belief in the blood of Jesus, the physical blood of Jesus, as though it's some magical portion because the blood of Jesus is no longer in existence. So what is powerful about the blood of Jesus? Now, his literal blood, like the literal blood of Jesus was the purest. It was the blood of God, the Bible says. But the literal blood of Jesus doesn't save if it did, then that blood that was splattered on the Roman soldiers as he was being nailed to the cross, that blood upon those soldiers would have atoned for their sins. So it's not some magical potion, some abracadabra. The blood, when the Bible speaks of the blood of Jesus, it speaks, listen, of the death of Christ. The atoning work of Jesus is in the shedding of his blood or the shedding of his life. For the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, and the life of the flesh is in the blood, the book of Leviticus tells us. So when the Bible speaks of the blood of Christ, it speaks of his substitutionary, sacrificial death on Calvary. And it's because he died a physical, literally physically died a physical death on that cross and conquered death and was raised on the third day and now seated at the right hand of the Father. It's because of his sacrificial life that all of us can have assurance of our salvation now and forever. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Paid in full. Hallelujah. By the shed blood of Jesus. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, these saints use the doctrine of atonement. Atonement, cleansing of our sins through the sacrificial work of Christ is what atonement means. Not as a pillow to rest their weariness, but as a weapon to subdue their sin. Thank God for the weapon and then the power that's in the blood of Jesus. But it's not as though we plea the blood of Jesus. I've never liked that term. I've never used that term. And some Christians use that term. No judgment. God's not going to get mad at you if you say that. But we don't plead the blood of Jesus, we declare the shed blood of Christ and the victory that Christ won for us on the cross. And what has power when you speak to demons is not pleading the blood, it's saying, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, come out, hallelujah, there's power in the name. So how do we overcome Satan? Number one, by the blood of the lamb. Number two, we overcome him by the word of your testimony. By the word 
of your testimony. Or you could say it this way, we overcome Satan by the word that is shared through our testimony because it's the word, the living word of God that defeats the devil every time. The word of your testimony. There's nothing as powerful as you sharing your testimony of how you came to faith in Christ. You say, well, you know, Pastor Carl, I don't have a testimony because you haven't been saved. We can fix that today. Amen. Because once you come to the realization that you're a lost sinner in need of a Savior, even if you were raised in a Christian home, there was a time when your heart warmed within you. A, 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 a statement that John Wesley himself made. Charles Wesley and John Wesley, these great brothers, missionaries, they were, they were winning souls to Jesus before they ever became Christians themselves. And they were on a boat one time, and they heard these uh, missionaries talking about their testimony, their faith in Christ. And he said this, he said, My heart was strangely warmed within me. And he realized that he didn't know Christ yet. He knew him here, but not here. And so he surrendered his life to Jesus and was gloriously born again. There's power in you sharing your testimony, however, wherever, and whenever the opportunity presents itself. And every one of you have a testimony of how Christ came into your life and saved your life. And it's when you share the word in the testimony, like the great John Newton. He wrote the greatest Christian hymn. He was a former wretched, heathen, sinful man, a slave trader. And he got saved and he repented for his slave, evil slave trading ways, his sinful ways. And he wrote the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. His testimony. He spoke the word of God's power through his testimony. And that's how you overcome the devil. By the blood of the lamb, by the word of your testimony. By making sure that, as it says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, that you are unashamedly confess Christ before men. And Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father's holy angels one day. But he gave a warning. He said, if you deny me before men, then I'll deny you before my Father. The power of the word in your testimony. One of the greatest testimonies recorded in the Bible is in John chapter 9. There's this man that was born blind. Jesus one day, out of mercy and grace, without him even asking for it, just heals him, and all of a sudden he can see. It was a, such a notable miracle, it stirred up the entire city and synagogue and all the people, and the Pharisees were so angry, and they interrogated this man. They wanted him to deny that Christ was a good man, and they kept pressuring him, and he said, listen, I don't know if he's a good man or a bad man. Here's all I know. I was blind, but now I see, and that guy did it. And he, he has this transformation. He goes, and you can see this in John 9, he goes from calling Jesus a man to a prophet, and he ends up calling him the Son of God. He ends up coming to personal faith in Christ because of his encounter and experience with the power of Christ in his life. And it was by the word of his testimony. Another great example is in Mark chapter 5. This man of Gadara, he was so demon-possessed that they couldn't contain him, restrain him. They put chains on him, and he had supernatural strength to break those chains because of the demons living inside of him. He lived in the tombs with the dead. He had no clothes on. He was a wild, crazy man. True story, Mark 5, Mark chapter 5, Gospel of Mark chapter 5. Jesus comes, sets him free. The guy, the Bible says, is seated. He's clothed. It says he's in his right state of mind. And the first thing he asks is, Jesus, I want, to, I want to follow you. I want to become one of these guys that are a part of your team. And Jesus said, no, I've got something better for you. I want you to go back to the Decapolis. That means the ten cities from where he had come from. I want you to go back, and I want you to tell them the good things that God has done for you. So this former demon-possessed guy had, had a legion of demons, anywhere from two to 6,000, because 2,000, a herd of pigs, 2,000 pigs, the demons, when, when Jesus cast the demons out of this guy, they went into that herd of pigs, and the herd of pigs went and drowned themselves. And the whole town was like, Jesus, please leave, don't ever come back. <laughs> they were more afraid of Jesus than they were of this crazy wild man living in the, in the, in the graveyard, right? So he goes back, and he shares his testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb by the word, the word in their testimony. And finally, number three, we overcome him by loving Christ to death. By not loving our lives to the death, which means you love Christ so much, if, if it came between your life and Christ, you would always pick Christ and you would give your life. Hopefully none of us will ever be challenged in that way. Living in America for the past hundred plus years, we haven't had to be challenged that way. But there are our brothers and sisters in Christ in China, North Korea, parts of the Middle East, Iran, 
where they are persecuted for their faith, in prison for their faith, and yes, even killed for their faith. But that's how you overcome. You overcome the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony, and that you love Christ so much, you love him that you're willing to give your life as he was willing to give his life for you. True story. John Chrysostom was a great early church father, a Greek convert to the Christian faith. And he was arrested by the emperor one day, and the emperor wanted to get this early church father to, to recant his faith. And so he asked his advisors, how can I do it? He said to his advisors, should I throw him in the deepest, darkest dungeon that we have? And they said, oh, no, no, that wouldn't work, emperor. This man so loves God, you would only be doing him a favor by giving him the solitude so he could pray and meditate till his death. He said, then I'll... I'll execute him. That's what I'll do. I will, I will execute him before all the people. And they said, no, no, that would be doing him a favor because that would be sending him to heaven. He said, well, what can we do? He said, the only way you could defeat him because he loves his God so much is get him to sin. If you can get him to sin, you will break his heart because John Chrysostom so loves his Savior. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and because they loved Christ to the point of death, if need be. And as the Apostle Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I hope in these last days we'll understand that our time is short. Christ could come today, could come tomorrow, it could be the next 10 years. But we're to live each day as though Christ is coming today, and we're to plan our future as though Christ is not coming back in our lifetime. And we must seize the day, carpe diem, for the days are evil, and that's why we must make the most of every opportunity. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today, and I just thank you for those that are here that have heard the message, heard what the Holy Spirit is saying, and will apply it in their lives beginning today. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive it, Lord. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today, watching online or in person, and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or you need to rededicate your life to Christ, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and the rest of the congregation is going to pray this prayer with you. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow's promise to no man. I command everyone here that's not serving Christ to surrender your life to Christ, but do it willingly and voluntarily. And those of you that need to rededicate your life to Christ, I want you to personalize this prayer as a prayer of rededication. But it's important that you say it with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart. Here we go, out loud together. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise, church family. God bless you. We love you.